Lovely evening. Welcome. This is Sports Zone on Joy Prime. My name is Fentio Tahiru Fentio. We are back again after a wonderful one month of Africa Cup of Nations football. Cote d'Ivoire are three time champions of the Africa Cup of Nations after coming from behind to beat Nigeria 2 1 in that Titanic final in Abidjan. We'll review what has been a Titanic Africa Cup of Nations, the most marketable, the biggest in terms of TV audience. The biggest, in fact, in terms of excitement and more so the biggest in terms of all the beautiful women you saw on your screens. This Cup of Nations has served the continent and beyond marketing value beyond anything you could ever imagine. But ultimately, there is world peace after Nigeria where silence. We'll look back on that uh, one month of football that has happened without focus, of course, on the final or the finale, which happened on Sunday night. We will also take you around Europe, where uh, Liverpool, Man City and Arsenal are going at it on the Premier League table. It's looking like a scintillating finish to the season. In the Serie A in Italy, well, hmm, Inter Milan are showing, are separating themselves from the boys, humbling and showing Daniele De Rossi what exactly it means to play in the Serie A or to coach in the Serie A. They've opened a seven-point lead at the top. In Germany, embarrassing defeat for Bayern Munich and Thomas Tuchel. But is his future in massive, massive doubt right now? We'll take you to Spain, where Barcelona have basically given up on the title chase by Real Madrid, reminding everyone why they're football royalty. The show is live and interactive here. Uh, on social media, do get in touch with us. Use the hashtag SportsZone on Twitter. Use the hashtag SportsZone on Twitter. And also, if you prefer WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp number is on your screen. Uh, we will uh, read your messages and, of course, share them with the rest of our viewers from across the globe. The show is proudly sponsored by Hunters, as well as Pridebed and Syntex Tank. Uh, do stay with us when we come back from this short break. I will introduce you to my amazing guest, and then we can start the conversation right here. All right, welcome back. This is Sports uh, Zone on Joy Prime. You're welcome to the show. Uh, it's live and interactive. Do send me a message. The number is on your screen. Uh, of course, uh, uh, let me try and get that number for you uh, uh, that you can use to get in touch with us here uh, on the show. But my guests are here. Um, Collins Atapoku. Is joined us this evening alongside Achutamakula. How are you guys? Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, man. Well, it's good to see you. Good to see you, man. You're looking uh, super, super nice. I used to be nice. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Listen, you were in Abidjan. Yeah. Listen, uh, the AFCON final, uh, amazing, but even more amazing were the scenes you were seeing after the 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 parade, the trophy parade, and everything. Everything we're seeing on TV and the pictures, that is really Abidjan, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, there's more to it. You get a natural feel of attraction. That's one. Patriotism. And then an unwavering commitment to hospitality that has been run through the entire country by the authorities. And in fact, one of the things that really stands out out of this competition, I know very well that it wasn't a fluke. It was calculated with probably some scientific basis. The placement of the teams of where these teams were supposed to base. Yeah. Ghana plays in Abidjan because you are three hours away from Ghana if you want to come and see Abidjan. So from Sampa, Doma Hinkro, Osei Kojo Chrome, Elubo, you could easily just come in in three hours, come and see the game, and then go back. Wow. Same applies to Boaké for Burkina Faso. So if you check their games in Boaké, anytime they played, the stadium was full, or almost full. And Burkina Faso actually believes Boaké is their spiritual home in wow. La Côte d'Ivoire. And then Mali in Korogo, which um, during the Timbuktu era was part of yes. um, the Grand Mali Empire. And when modernity and colonialism came in, uh, they decided to take that out. So Mali actually believed that any game they played in Korogo, they were going to win. Going and to it was win. their home game. And every single game they played there, the stadium was either full or almost full. So it was a master stroke of a decision. Wow. And I think in the case of Ghana, if you take La Côte d'Ivoire, the host team, away, any time Ghana played, we recorded the second most attendance True. True. in Abidjan True. compared to the other countries. True. True. Every, every Ghana game had a massive atmosphere. Uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. It was incredible. 
Uh, actually, let's talk about the game itself then. Uh, let's go through the match, okay? Uh, shall we? This was built to be one of those matches where everyone believed that Cote d'Ivoire uh, were the underdogs, simply because of the way Nigeria played all the way through. But in the end, uh, it was, of course, Cote d'Ivoire who showed great, they showed character, uh, they showed a lot of determination to get past uh, Nigeria, get from a goal down to beat the Nigerians. It's an unbelievable result, really, because I don't think any of us, well, some of us gave Cote d'Ivoire a chance, but everything looked like it was gearing towards a Nigeria win, and then they scored first, and it looked like, you know what, this is going according to the script, because Nigeria don't need a possession, they, they score one and it's game over. But it wasn't. It wasn't. I think that the pre-match talk was largely influenced by the fact that Nigeria had created this mystique about them that you can't put a ball in the back of the net, And so it will take something otherworldly for the Iverians to get a goal. Meanwhile, on the other end, Arikos always considered goals and they always give teams a chance before they'll come back into the game. And you were going into that final, you were thinking if they let Nigeria score first, they were never going to get a, a way back. But what we saw as I've said, and as has been consistent in each of Arico's games, is a team that has been prepared and provisioned for the challenges that the opponents are going to throw up. So you look at the way the, Ivorian, the Nigerian team set up and how Cote d'Ivoire played. They did not have to deviate from the way they've, they've set up in the games against, against Senegal, in the games against Mali, in the games against DR Congo, in the sense that the only substitution was the introduction of Jean-Michel Seri for Ibrahim Sangari. Otherwise, it was Seri as the anchor. It was the man in Seko Fofana that they had to do the build-up through and then out, get the ball out to the wide areas through Simon Adingra. Yeah. The key component here for me was the fact that, and this is something that we highlighted on a number of occasions on AFCON today, how the space between Nigeria's left wing back and then the left centre-back, and then the holding midfielder. So regular viewers would remember that we highlighted the fact that that space was a spot that opponents love to exploit because of the presence of Alexi Wobi. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Nigerian fans have singled him out. He's had to delete all of his pro-Nigeria con content on that his was Instagram wild. page. And that's the second time in two years he's been forced to do that. After the World Cup playoff, around the same time two years ago, when Ghana qualified at their expense, he had to do that as well. And for some time, he wasn't saying it. Making any post on, on social media because of the sheer abuse. But you cannot really blame him because, look, he didn't fashion out how the team played. I think Nigeria came into this game hoping that that one goal will be enough. And if you look at the stats, they didn't come to play. They had one goal, an XG of 0 0.27. Wow. Which means they were not even expected to score a goal. Conversely, Ivory Coast had 18 shots on goal. 18 shots on goal. And I think about nine of them on target. And for a final, that tells you one thing. They beat the Nigerians into submission. They created the, the most chances. Look, Simon Adingra. And, and for me, he was the best or, or the key component in what the Ivorians did on the day because he won most of the duels, all of the duels over Ola Aina, who, when he came up against... At that time, the best player of the tournament in Gelson Dalla completely shackled him. But the difference here was in the difference of skill. So Adengra had a combination of pace, of dribbling ability, and remarkable end products to go. Ultimately, it paid off for Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Collins, I mean, for Nigeria, this was... It was simply deserved in a way, uh, in that I feel like they've kind of Rating their lag a lot in this tournament all the way to the final. There's not one game where I watch Nigeria, and this, this is not being me adding insult to injury, but there's not one game where I watch Nigeria and I was really excited about what I saw against South Africa. The South Africans were the better team against Angola, something similar. In the group stages, maybe in the game against Cote d'Ivoire, even though Cote d'Ivoire dominated, you know, footballing wise, Maybe somebody would say, you know what, the team that actually went out to play the football won. Absolutely. And you look at the statistics from the game, attempts alone should give you an indication of how dominant the elephants had been in the game. Look, 
in the key transitional moments, yeah. Nigeria prevailed. That game against Cameroon, we had seen what had happened at the opposite end. Only for one of the center backs, I think it was Omar Gonzalez, to lose concentration, to be robbed of the ball by Osimen. He ends up feeding Lukman, game is done. So they, they've been very decisive in the key transitional moments. The, the, the reflection of how they've actually benefited yeah. from these key transitional moments was how things stand when they played against South Africa. And you actually referenced that, that South Africa played the better football on the day, but didn't win the game. Look, Nigeria were South Africa in disguise in that game, yeah. not performance-wise, but key transitional moments-wise. You get an opportunity to get a second goal through Seaman. It is ruled out. VR interrupts you, go and check, and then there's a penalty call yeah. at the other side. That's what Nigeria has been with. I should mention Jelson Dalla and how they brought on another striker. He was in the night jersey. He had an opportunity to actually aim for goal with a curl. I was watching that game with Opoku and he said, look, yeah. you don't attack that ball that way. He actually managed to find an upright instead of the goal. So in the key transitional moments, things fell in place for Nigeria. Yeah. But they have not been a dominant performer. Like say, we saw in the opening game between Senegal and Gambia. We see Senegal laying down the marker yeah. that I'm dominating you, I'm dictating the tempo, I'm carrying the fight to you, and I'm coming to beat you. And Nigeria didn't do that. But in those key transitional moments, they prevailed. But in this very game, the perpetrators of the key transitional moments had to defend for their lives. One of them was Olaina. This was a game where the game had been taken to him. So he couldn't just be... And he really struggled. I mean, he, you can't even come like you've been doing all the time. Yeah. He comes in becomes an auxiliary winger, and you find either Moses or whoever is on his flank tucking in to join the attack, to create width for him, to operate with. And they were a bit negative because they knew exactly how they had come this yeah. far. Solid defense, not conceding much, and picking off on the key transitional moments. Yeah. But it was not going to happen with La Côte d'Ivoire because, one, they are playing with emotion. And since that game against Senegal, when they put in that through ball, that was meant for Christian Kwame instead. He actually evaded the pass, and then Pepe was coming in from somewhere, and then won a penalty off Mendy. Yeah. That's when the tournament changed. The turning point. That was their turning point, and right after that penalty incident, you could see that they come at you with some bit of emotion. Yeah. And coaches usually say this, look, players tend to go in for tackles that hitherto they wouldn't have gone in for when they have the emotion and adrenaline playing them on. Sure. And that's exactly what La Côte d'Ivoire did. Look, one thing that actually hindered them in the early stages of the competition was the absence of Ale and Adingra. They did. They provide them a unique option that they wouldn't get. A towering presence up front, who is not just good with his head, but also with his feet, and has a lot of supreme positional awareness, and then an outlet on the wing, who wouldn't do what Pepe does? Yeah. He's that direct, yeah, pacey, very direct. and very skillful. So you look at Krasso, yeah. and then you look at Edinga. Even it's the Akite. Even two the different... Even the Akite. And this guy has end product. The, the players that are, have left their mark on this tournament, the manner in which the teams that have won the last four Afghans have won it, tells you one thing. The African game has evolved. Reactionary, risk-averse, defensive football no longer works on the continent. Absolutely. Pay attention to the teams that have won, won AFCON 2023, 2021, 2019, 17. All of them play attacking. Ball playing. Attacking yeah. football. Yeah. Teams that play on the front foot and are not reactionary. They yeah. take the game to you and they, they take the initiative. Pay attention to the teams that these countries have beaten. Egypt went to the last AFCON final not winning a game in regulation time. Imagine so that. Hoping that they were going to win. In the final, what happened to them? They were required to play on the front foot. And because they had not been trained to play in that manner, the muscle memory simply did not exist. It was impossible to flick that switch from that fixation with solidity, closing out the lines, cutting out the number of chances the opponents are able to create, to actually being able to do that, but also playing on the front foot and then fashion out goal-scoring chances and then convert them. Because that requires that you are open. If you look at the first chance of the game that the Ivorians created yesterday, 
it was because Nigeria tried to play out from the back. Now, traditionally, their shape was not horrible. I'm talking about the Simon Adingra chance that he fired and then Stanley Nwabili saved. Yeah. But it was because they had not done that too often to be able to see how teams will react when they open up that match. So you realize that Simon Adingra was within 20 yards. The closest Nigerian player to him was about 20 yards away, which is unheard of. Nigeria previously had not afforded any forward that much space, yeah. especially even when they were building up. But this is something that they were forced to do because of just how good the Ivorians were with, the, with their pressing. And that's something we had not spoken about. And so the African game has changed. The players we're, we are producing now are being trained to play on the front foot, to be very offensive and attacking-oriented. Look at the best players that the continent has pr produced. They are all attacking midfielders or forwards or strikers, yeah, right? And that means that whatever the coaches are that you are going to choose or hire to coach these players, their philosophy, the methods that they believe in have to be consistent or marriable with the skill sets of the, the players that we are producing. The we have now. Well, isn't it intriguing that, like, that explosive winger has come to the fore in all these three editions that actually referred to? Um, Basugo was unheard of. He picked us apart in the semi-final. Mm -hmm. And it was one that kept them tick when they came back to 1-1 one, one, one in that final. Then Another Egypt went that, ahead. Uh, Mares? Yes. In Egypt? Christian Atu before. Yeah, exactly. So Atu, Basugog, Mares. Mani. I mean, come on. And now Adingra. Uh, so this has been a tournament of surprises. Most of the big teams were out. In fact, all of, all of Africa's top five round teams were out by the round of 16. And all of the North African teams were out by the round of 16. Not one of them made it into sports final. So it was really that bad. Uh, and no favorite team actually did as well as people predicted them to do. Most notably, Morocco, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, they went to... The Western media's favorite. Before anybody could... But Morocco, they, uh, they, 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 they had more... In fact, they had more air time on the television yesterday during the celebrations, mostly because... It was thanks to their 1-0 win against Zambia in the last group game <laughs> that Cote d'Ivoire uh, made it out of the group with just three points. And the celebrations that followed since then, yeah. absolutely incredible stuff. Uh, the scenes as well and the trophy parade uh, that has since happened. I wonder when we'll ever see that um, in Ghana. Oh, when will we ever see that in Ghana? <laughs> when will we ever see that in Ghana? Uh, let's pray and hope that people start acting right. Oh, God. The streets were absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. But, you know, and it says everything. When you put your house together, you put your acts together, and the people win, everybody is happy. Look, if we had won the Afghan, we will have no time thinking about demonstration. Okay? No, 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 but we have no, nothing nobody to do cares. now, so we have no, time for demonstration. No, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Look, That's nobody cares about demonstration. But look, we want to feel this. Our fathers lost it in 92. We lost it in 2015. Yeah. Look, 2010. Look, no, look, look, this thing is bad. <laughs> we might not have this thing in our lifetime. We may not. Look, that's why I would Don't say that. No, we may know, not. When you put it like that, I, I, I want to collapse and die. But no, that's because, the reality. Look, because we'll never experience this. No, yeah. it's, it's painful. It's painful. Look, look there, at the streets. Come on. It's like, ah, oh, man. For the next one month, every national problem there is solved. Oh, it's yes. Free Soloku, we can go and kiss her. No, no. How can we treat the Soloku song? Oh, man. Ghana Blaster. Ghana Vubo. Free Soloku on the streets, we can't kiss her. What is this, Achu? All the things you can do. All... <laughs> <laughs> so pressing our talent. In a crowd like this. So pressing our... <laughs> All the things you can do in a crowd like but look, this. Friends, the, what were we try to laugh about all of the problems that we have. There are lessons from this Afghan. If we're minded to, we can take some of these lessons and use them to build our game. I'll always say this. No matter how bad our football is, our national team should never be a reflection of the current state of affairs of our football if we, are, if we find the right solution. Argentina have perhaps the worst run football federation in the world. Absolutely. But they picked the right players got lucky by getting a good coach, created an enabling environment, and most importantly, found a way of decoupling the national team from the football so that the team will be insulated from 
all the bad vibes, all the toxicity brewed in their local football, get this thing right. Look, there are low-hanging fruit. We, we don't need a 10-year development program to win the next AFCON or to break this AFCON duck. It is possible to do it. The only Just get pro the right coach, the, the right players. The only problem I have is that the kind of leaders we, we have, from government, sports ministry to the Ghana Football Association, they will not fix the problems. And that is why we will demonstrate. Because if you don't speak truth to power, if we don't call these people attention to it, they will take the team to the next Afghan. We'll probably make the semis when the team is good. Because per the current state of affairs, I will not be surprised if we struggle to make even the next Afghan. But if we somehow stumble upon a good team again, we'll start singing praises and all of us will forget that our local football is dying. Interesting. All right. You're watching Sports Zone. Uh, your messages are welcome on 0240 Also, the show is brought to you by Hunters, uh, who are introducing the Hunters Red Apple Cider. It's crisp and it's refreshing. Whatever your refreshment needs are in that family gathering or that vacation, make sure your refreshment of choice is Hunters. You can get uh, Hunters from any uh, store. Uh, around the country, just ask and insist on Hunter's uh, cider. Um, it's got real apples, of course. It's another quality product by Casa Preco. If you want to buy in bulk quantity, just call them on 0262-351-251. 0262-351-251 and get yourself some Hunter's. Also, Syntex Tank are uh, proud sponsors of this program. Um, Whatever the kind of preferred color of water tank you, what you want, they have it for you. What kind of inner layer do you want? Whether double, triple, quadruple, as many layers as you want. So we're also the first water tank company to introduce, of course, uh, white inner layer uh, for water tanks. And they have it in all kinds of sizes. And they have over 300 agents nationwide. So if you're interested in... Uh, buying for yourself a Syntex tank, which you should, because we can't depend on certain people. You're building a project, you need one. Well, let's just finish his project. He has a Syntex tank in there. Don't you? Because if you don't have a water tank, I do, I do, I do. you are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so get the right water tank, buy from Syntex, a strong, a tough. Uh, of course, you can call them at 244 3351 and uh, wherever you are, they will deliver to you. They do deliveries, of course. Uh, Syntex Tank, a strong a up. Also, Pridebet, uh, also uh, here with us. Uh, make sure that you go to pridebet.com.gh. They're giving lots of exciting gifts for you. Uh, you uh, if you visit and register, you can enjoy up to 100% uh, welcome bonus on your first deposit. So Pridebet, let's go. Remember, T's and C's apply. And Pridebet is regulated by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. All right, um, let's head to Cote d'Ivoire now and speak to John Boifu, who I'm sure was in that line in, uh, in the Soloku line in Abidjan. <laughs> I'm sure. John, uh, how are you? Uh, did you join the party on the street? Because I'm telling Achuin here in the studio about the free Soloku that was happening uh, on the streets. Uh, where were you? Hey, friends. Uh, thanks for having me. I wasn't in the line today. I wasn't uh, able to party. I was That's rather tired, disappointing. So... Yeah, no, no, no. So it, it looked it looked really great from far, but I was uh, afraid that it would be quite, quite hectic. So I decided to to enjoy it from the comfort of, of my home, from the AC, away from the heat. But uh, yesterday we definitely did. We did party. We were able to to enjoy it. We were out in the streets. People were just out and, and, and dancing and jubilating. Um, you know, it's just the joy and just the joy that this team has been able to, to bring to the people of Ivory Coast has been nothing short but, but uh, than miraculous. It's been fantastic ride, you know, from the brink of death, how they're able to, to come back and, and really give this joy to, to the people of, of Ivory Coast. And Ev is fine now. I mean, I'm sure they'll give him a lifetime contract. Look, I've never seen uh, any team win any tournament in more extraordinary circumstances compared to this. Because, listen, they fired a coach believing they were not even going to qualify. 
Then when they qualified by virtue of some miracle that, you know, that Morocco performed for them, and then, which Richard Ofori also contributed to with his <laughs> magic hands, um, MS5 then is get installed uh, as, the, as, the, as the new head coach, and he does the unthinkable, the impossible. Yeah, he definitely did the unthinkable, the impossible, and it's it's just been it's just been crazy because if you remember when they appointed him, they were also trying to do a side deal with Hervé Renard for him to take over the team until the end of the of, of the tournament, and in the end that fell through. And and Hermes kept calm and composed and was able to inspire this team, these twenty seven players, to to become warriors on the pitch to to do their best to to make the. The, the, the country proud and they were able to do that and it's funny though because yesterday at the stadium there was a, a sense of expectancy that people knew that it was going to happen um, even when they conceded that goal at 1-0 they were still there you know getting up and 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 trying to to, to push push the team forward they understood that with that their support the team might be not be able to make it and they did all the best and and they scored that equalizer and then and then uh, Sebastian Haller scored that you know 2-1 goal that you know put put the, the, our, the our fellow Nigerians or Nigerian friends to bed uh, and um, listen uh, if you're talking about uh, Winning the Afro is a big deal. This is called the Voice Third win, obviously. Um, you know, elsewhere on the continent, we, we know how people like to make crazy promises to people when they achieve something remarkable. Anything of the sort, some promise of houses, Range Rovers, or what's going on? Or how are they rewarding these gallant elephants? So um, as of now, there's no word on on housing or Range Rover. If they have a Range Rover for me, I'll I'll, I'll take it. But um, <laughs> but the truth is, really, I mean, th these guys are now national heroes. All 27 players, the coaching staff, and then MS Fire as well. Because uh, I mean, if you think about it, he's only coached at this level four games, four games, and he's won the Afcon. And we've known other coaches that have coached for for quite a long time, and they haven't been able to. To, to win, to to do as well as he has. So um, it's been fantastic. I think that the reward will come from the the the, the happiness that they see in in, in some of the players. Um, so. I mean, probably they'll get something out of it because the uh, president Ado is really was sorry. I said Ado. <laughs> That's his, <laughs> his 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 nickname. His the the president Watara. Sorry, um, is is really vested in in. In in this uh, Ivorian team, he 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 really did everything that he could to to ensure that this was the best ever Afcon from the spending uh, to refurbish some of these stadiums, create or build new stadiums, and then the infrastructure that goes around it. Uh, we looked at the twenty four training pitches that were were, were refurbished or built uh, to be able to accommodate the twenty four teams. You know, they really didn't spare any anything to to ensure that it was the it was the best AFCON ever and that the teams were put in the best conditions to be able to perform. And thankfully, this Ivorian team, after slipping up on the in the second and third game, uh, were able to, you know, keep the, the trophy home. Yeah, it's unbelievable, uh, John. But uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your time, uh, John. Uh, it's been amazing speaking to you all throughout this month of AFCON. Uh, you've been... A very, you've been a very, very big help to us here uh, at the multimedia group with all your your cheer and always, uh, you know, your willingness to always avail yourself and provide us insights that we otherwise uh, wouldn't have gotten if you weren't there. So thank you for moving to Côte d'Ivoire, to Abidjan. <laughs> <laughs> when we come there, uh, hopefully the next time we make the trip, I'll tell you, cool. They were lucky to have made the trip. Did yeah. you get to meet him? I thought you yeah, I did, I did, I did, I did. I yes, met him. Yes, yes, yes. We, 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 we met, we, we hung out a bit. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, to meet more, but, I mean, he promised to, to bring you next time for us to be able to eat some <laughs> chicken fish. Listen, 
I, I hope you keep the party going because I have plans of coming to Abidjan just to join the solo cool line. <laughs> you understand? Because yeah, please do. I've please had, do. had a conversation with my wife, um, you know, and she said the only <laughs> look if that if Ghana ever wins the Afcon, I have permission to join solo cool and do solo cool for one week straight. With, it's, it's like that, like, you know, and I've got the moves to back it, so, what? you know. <laughs> the moves to back it? <laughs> yeah, not serious. All right, thank you, John. Uh, John Boa for Thanks joining us all Thanks the way from Abidjan. Uh, he's a uh, football business uh, man in Abidjan, uh, always with some wonderful insights from that country as far as the AFCON is concerned. Uh, there were some hours handed out. The best player of the tournament went to Truce de Corps of Nigeria. Uh, and the goalkeeper of the tournament went to Rowan Williams. And, of course, uh, you also had the top scorer going to <laughs> William Sue. <laughs> Sue was top scorer after round of 16. And then he came back to the tournament uh, dressed like a hip-hop musician. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was out for so long, he forgot it was a football tournament. But he got back to receive his award as well. So, wonderful stuff. Uh, also, by the way, South Africa beat uh, DR Congo in the third place playoff match. One of the most boring matches. It, it, it probably a game that did very little to help the course of the third place playoff match because there's a massive call for that kind of game or for that game to be scrapped because it makes no sense. And just going through that snoot fest confirmed everything and justified every reason why people want a third place playoff match uh, to, be, uh, to be completely scrapped. Anyway... You're watching Sports Zone on Joy Prime. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're taking you straight into Europe because of the action from the Premier League, from the Serie A, from the Liga and the Bundesliga, fascinating. There's also Champions League football to come uh, on Tuesday and on Wednesday. So we'll look ahead to the matches as well. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. This is Sports Zone on Joy Prime. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, a key reminder here. Um, for those of you who are looking for the port number on your screen, uh, we're having a bit of a problem with it, but so I'm going to mention it to you, and then you can, uh, you can, uh, you can then um, write it down, okay? Just make sure you write the number down and send me a message right now. The number is this, um, 0240. Okay, 0240, that's our WhatsApp number, 0240, 910-330, 0240-910-330, that's the WhatsApp number, 0240-910-330. Write it down, send us a message, uh, and then, of course, we'll read those messages for you, 0240-910-330. Also, leave me a message on Twitter used the hashtag sports zone. All right, cool. Now, um, <laughs> the Premier League, absolutely fascinating stuff happening. Arsenal are just refusing to lie down. They took on West Ham. They had already met West Ham twice this week, uh, this season. And West Ham have had the better of them. So they went to the West Ham Stadium or the London Stadium and they absolutely destroyed them by six goals to nil. Take a look. More of an end swing on this latest one. It's small margins. Ask. Now they look long right through the middle for Saka. And what's the decision going to be here? Yellow card. With a chance to make it 2-0. With a plot. Rice with the ball in. It's three. The gunner is showing a real appetite for destruction. You see them, they all started in that offside position, then stepped to get the three goals. Erdegaard. Trossards! It's four! Trossard firing it at Rice, but he fielded it very well. 
Erdegaard four for Saka, it opens up for him, and there is number five. Bakayo Saka is on a hat-trick. There's Ben White. Back behind Erdegaard. Oh, what a goal! Of course, it had to be Declan Rice. Forever a hero in Claret and Blue, but one of West Ham's most story players adds another ignominious insult to a chapter of horrors. All right, Arsenal absolutely destroying West Ham uh, and going to 52 points level with Manchester City. Listen, we can say all we want uh, and talk about Arsenal having the tendency to bottle it or, or whatever, but this season, Arsenal are just refusing to die, at least not early. It takes you back to those days to Fulham, and I think, I think Bournemouth, yeah. somewhere in December, and where Arsenal could have been, but for those defeats. But the good thing this time around is that they've managed to shake that off. We're beginning to see a more ruthless side of Arsenal, which we expected to see at the beginning of the season after they made that outlay for Kai Havertz, in the sense that if you needed goals, if you missed out on the Premier League last season because in the home stretch, you simply could not find the legs and the goals to get you over the line. And you shell out north of 67 million pounds. The expectation will be that the player who comes in either produces the goals or contributes in the creation of those goals. That has not happened for half a season. But all is not lost yet. They are still in the picture. And this is the time when he has to show that inspiration. Unfortunately, it, he was not the man at the heart of it. It was all about Martin Odegaard and then Bukayo Saka. But Arsenal wouldn't care. You just want to see consistency from them and for them to show a bit more personality because when City have won the league, when Liverpool have won the league, the big personalities in that team have stood out in the home stretch of the season. And that's what you expect to see from Arsenal. I don't think Gabriel Jesus or Eddie Nketiah are the guys to do that. Maybe Bukayo Saka, to a certain extent, Martin Odegaard, because he's not a match winner in the strictest sense. But you want to see that Kai Havertz is able to make his significant contribution um, one way or the other because Arsenal will need someone to step up. And if they, they spend the most amount of money on him, it is not out of place to expect that he chips in with some contribution. Um, Collins, you are a Liverpool fan, obviously, but I'm, I'm looking at Liverpool with the intention of having a fairy tale end to the season and what Arsenal are doing with all the wounds from last season. Talent-wise, both teams might not be at the same level. I think Liverpool are probably uh, maybe a couple of steps better. But this Arsenal team, they've been here before and it didn't work out. This season, when you watch them, do you think they've learned their lessons? They've actually learned their lessons and upgraded the team by adding players like Harvest to the team. But there's one thing with the Premier League. The dynamics have shifted and has been altered in such a manner that it takes perfection to win. That's not it. Wow. Interesting. So, for me, like, this was a game where I felt Arsenal were, they were simply unplayable. You know, I, I think West Ham had no solutions whatsoever. And they deserved it, West Ham. I mean, if, if that was Chelsea, they suddenly turned into prime Barcelona of 2009. But, but, that, but that's the point. That's the point. That's made that. Arsenal have to look like this every weekend. Absolutely. To win the yeah. That's what he means by they have to be perfect. And yeah, it's like <laughs> one West Ham. That's quite enough. Had beaten Arsenal at home in the league. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And them out of the league Carabao league. Cup or something. League Cup, yeah. Look, I mean, it can't continue. Like, so for the first time in 99 years, West Ham were looking to beat Arsenal three times in, in the season. season. Hey, that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to happen. But the beautiful thing about the setup was that they tried through the middle. It didn't work for 30 minutes. And then they switched to the set pieces, overloading certain spaces within the box. And my pick of the bunch was Gabriel Megalis' header. You could see that it had been worked out, thought of. The first goal came from the back post, and this one was from the near post. So. And the offside positioning of yeah. uh, Kai Havertz before Magaias made the run inside. It was a beautiful decoy. For me, the highlight of the game was definitely Declan Rice's goal. Uh, because he was giving a lot of stick in that first leg. Yeah.
uh, when West Ham beat them, and then started their fans started thinking he should have signed for a better club, he should have signed <laughs> for a bigger club. And now he's come and he's scored an absolute delta. Let's talk about a team that is also a, in a bit of a resurgence, all right? The manager is now talking big. He said they can beat anybody. Man United went to Aston Villa. Aston Villa were a top four team when Man United visited there. And United somehow got a 2-1 win to everybody's surprise. Delivered by Bruno Fernandes. McGuire again. Hoyland! No flag! He's a yard behind everybody else. Once you see everybody gaining ground, you've got to get out. He's ball watching there. In swinger for Bailey. It was Moreno. It's Longley. What a save on Anna. Bailey again. Douglas Luiz. Watch his shoulders in the celebration. This is what it means to Aston Villa. <laughs> Good finish. Minu. Nice feet. Dello's delivery. That could be the winning goal. Scored by Scott McTominay! Scott McTominay when this ball arrives. But McTominay is too big, protects the space. Delivered by Bruno Fernandes. Maguire again. Uh, Man United winning by two goals to one. Um, listen, Collins, United, they found their form again. What's that down to? Is it the key players, they're well coming back from injury, Casemiro, most notably... Um, Martinez came back last week, but then got injured again. But United seem to have found a bit of rhythm, a bit of stability uh, with them. And the out of goal scoring had been restricted to a few. And the key members, key elements within the attack, not firing. Talk about Rashford and his profligacy, yeah. leading to that long drought. And then Bruno Fernandez's goals drying up from midfield. So the goals were far and few, and they were conceding a lot. But this time around, they get three chances likely to hit the target twice. One of them certainly is not. So you look at the confidence of these and the art of building it. Uh, you could say that Was Hoyland was doing pretty well in Europe. But whenever he came to the Premier League, he made a different story for him. His head was down at some point, but it didn't kill him. He actually killed it. And he needed to get the first one in. And as soon as he did, you could see some confidence coming into his game. That goal he scored against West Ham propelled his action this week. You could see there's a player playing with confidence and freedom. Whenever an attacker does that, even if he misses five chances in a game, he's optimistic he'll get another one. Yeah. That is going to be it. So there is cutting edge to their play, and they aren't as jittery as before. But then again, their manager shouldn't be talking big. Because you look at what they have currently. If Oli Watkins, who has proven to be one of the best finishers in the league this season, yeah. had that confidence around his ability, Rasmus Hoyland has that. That game is a game Aston Villa could have turned on its head easily. Then again, they were profligate, and then they made a very good goalkeeper. You put all these things together. It comes to a point where you say that we have patches for players. When players make a team, the team is also going to have a patch. My son are having a patch. You talked about the confidence and, and, and what have you. What has changed about Hoyland? Has he always been the same? Or something significant has changed that he's now finding the back of the he, I think he's playing with a bit more confidence and assurance now. Obviously, as I was explained, what confidence does for a striker. But you also find that there are less and less instances of players getting in his way. So you realize that the sticky wicket period coincided with the purple patch of Scott McTominay. A lot of the positions that he was taking, including the goal that McTominay scored, yeah. are center forward positions that he should be taking, which means that's a service that alternatively should be coming to him or ordinarily. Not alternatively, but you had this weird situation where the centre forward was not the man that the service was coming to, it was going to other players. I mean, you'd find situations where Antoni gets into a very good wide position, Alejandro Ganacho as well, and they back themselves to score instead of finding the centre forward who is, who by trade is supposed to be scoring the goals. And so 
I think there is a bit of that. They may have uh, a chance of more to be. Not necessarily, not a matter of trust. It's just the instruction that they have, be, they have been given that get the ball into those zones. Because you do not have the authority to make those decisions just yet that you want to attempt to score in, in every situation. All right. Let's go to uh, Liverpool Football Club. They took on Burnley and... It well, at some point, it looks like it was close, but in the end, it really wasn't close. Uh, Liverpool ran away 3-1 winners. Very comfortable victory in the end, that game. Once you see everybody gaining ground, you've got to get out. He's ball-watching there. That's Amdouni. That's a really top stop from Kelleher. Here's Doku. Increasingly seems as though he might get a key, and he's got the better of Godfrey, and he's... Picking out Haaland, but it was just too high. Haaland couldn't get over the top of it. And it goes away. Strange old clearance. Ake's underneath it. Ake again. A Kanji man. That's Amdouni. That's a really top stop from Kelleher. Trafford doesn't get there. And Liverpool score. It's Diogo Jota again. Who else could it be right now? other than Diogo Jota. Goals galore for the Portuguese international. Delivery and a free header. Oh, it's in. It's brilliantly met by O'Shea. Jota. Oh, McAllister might win that. And it's going to break towards Elliot. McAllister stays down. Liverpool are playing on. And it's in. It's in from Luis Diaz, who made it his look towards the referee except Harvey Elliott and Luis Diaz who went to made a goal might have been interested on VAR though. this could be interesting because Fofana's run away it's a great stop by the goalkeeper Otto Bears wild the goal wasn't exactly gaping but it was there to hit well that will break for Fofana and he's not taken the chance again Unable to send it forward, it's Luis Diaz, Nunez wants it, Luis Diaz is going on his own, the ball a little behind Diogo Jota, Trafford saves again, Robertson sends it high and long towards Van Dijk, Kwanzaa, close, as close can be, the Liverpool's corner is taken by Robertson, it's going to come through to Diogo Jota, Heck of a strike for Farner, charge it down. Elliot and Nunez! That is That's Amdouni. That's a really top stop. All right, so Liverpool uh, absolutely dismissing Burnley there by three goals to one. What about Manchester City? Uh, they took on Everton, and dear, oh dear, they have missed Erling Haaland. He scored a brace to give them a very comfortable 2 deal win. Doku increasingly seems as though he might get a key and he's got the better of Godfrey and he's picking out Haaland but it was just too high Haaland couldn't get over the top of it and it goes away strange old clearance Ake's underneath it Ake again a Kanji may be and a good block it was Tarkovsky every time City have a glimmer someone like Branthwaite or on this occasion Tarkovsky gets in the way Alvarez headed down by Diaz. Ake couldn't get it. Holland! It took till the 71st minute, but at last, the Blues have found a way. Holland's first goal since November, and the big man is back in the goals. And knowing him, he'll surely go on a run of goals, and that's what it means to Pep. Ake's okay, done really well. Probably. One, two tackles in a row, De Bruyne, and, and now Haaland, and Branthwaite can't hold him off. Two. It didn't take him long to find his next goal. Erling Haaland with two goals. It's been a really, really difficult game, this one, but it will feel so satisfying. And Erling Haaland, desperate to find the goal again, now gets two. And Pep Guardiola knows that will surely be enough. Oh, now the flag has stayed down. De Bruyne is through. Haaland wants a hat-trick. De Bruyne went for it. 
and it's the top of the net big smile on his face I'm not sure if he saw Haaland knowing him he probably did but he thought why not here's Doku 2-0 and now those three are absolutely inseparable Liverpool on top uh, with 54 points Arsenal and Man City behind 52 points each and Man City is the one that have played one game less so if they can get a victory in that game that would be it um quick thoughts on how the title race is chasing up by the way Chelsea is currently drawing 1-1 with <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised they, they are not down already but there's still some time for that so. I felt this one day we're going to win yeah there's still yeah. some time for Palace to wrap it up so. uh yeah, yeah well um, <laughs> friend, it, listen it, it, everybody expects <laughs> Like, well, not everybody. I think there was a point where people expected that Liverpool, as Man City would win the league. But given the emotions at Liverpool right now with the club announcement and Ateta celebrating like jogging club, it's, it, it is shaping up to be some dramatic end. Again, nobody has got the tools to do what Manchester City is doing. And the best way to counter what they are doing is to give them a very big gap by entering it. Yeah. It has proven to be the only workable formula as adopted by Liverpool in the 2019-20. Anytime Liverpool have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, they end up edging them with a point. The only change in the dynamic this time around is that if Liverpool are able to hang in, and I mean every bit of that, you have to hang in and hope that you beat them at home because you have a game against them. Wow. The only way out. Other than that, you can even beat them but you won't comfortably beat other teams like they would do. That's true. And they have every chip in their armory going to... They've got it. White I mean, players, I mean, look at players. it. Look at it. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah, standard. If Liverpool were playing Arsenal for a league title, I'd be a lot comfortable. Yeah. But it's Manchester City. I've got news for the report, but for the two of you. Juventus? Chelsea <laughs> have just scored the winner. Am I told? You know who? Oh, Nagalaga scored a brace oh, wonderful. against Palace. <laughs> against Palace, yeah. A team he spent <laughs> yeah, a so season on loan at. He knows the And the goal's great. The goals of football, we thank you. <laughs> 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 the goals of football, we thank you. A key reminder, again, for those of you, like I said, a slagging isn't working, so forgive us. So the number is not on your screen. But I'm going to mention it to you, 0240 Very easy, 0240 uh, 910330. Lots of you have sent in messages already. Those of you that bothered enough to write it down or tap it down on your phone and save it. Uh, Hagens is uh, sending this message from Bichin and he says, My plea is to the journalists concerning the demo. They should be in one accord in discharging this course. We did their back. I love mm -hmm. your panelists, he says. Thank you. This message says, My name is uh, Prosper, currently in Tamale. My darling club has need an antidote. I can't even watch their game again. Oh, what a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good evening, fan. I'm enjoying your program here in China, the Upper East region. I think this Afcon is the best I've ever seen. Uh, the only There's China in the Upper East region? Yeah, yes. China. 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 Oh, I heard yeah. China. No, I said China. Right. It means you've never heard it. <laughs> that was Abu Ghabi Palace, Constantine. Yeah. Yes. I've never been there. China. It's in the Upper East region. Uh, I think this Afcon is the best I've ever seen. The only disappointment was the third and fourth place match. I'm particularly happy Nigeria did not win. This is Castro Steven from China. He sent in that message. There's more here. Uh, this one says, um, uh, good evening, Sports Zone. My Arsenal is taking the trophy this season. Amen. And then uh, this is Queen Kisses of Ghana Air Force, he says. So he sent us a nickname and tell us where you work. Brilliant. Fantastic, isn't it? Uh, good evening, guys. Since the people at the FA are simply not serious and they're clueless. Hence, our abysmal performance at the AFCON Green in Seoul to have sent in that message. This one says, good evening, uh, guys. Has the transfer caught Mr. Kuali Sata for Kutu Joy Sports or what? Congrats to Avery Coach. This is from Utala Tanko. No, he's visiting. He's our very good friend. This message says... Um, uh, hold on, he says, good evening, City versus Chelsea next week. Okay, so what, you've got a prediction? Uh, let us know.
You're watching the Sports Zone, sending your messages to a number to do so is 0240-910-330. 0240-910-330. When we come back from this break, we'll take you to Spain and then to Italy and Germany, where there was a fascinating game between Leverkusen, coached by Xavi Alonso, and by Minik, coached by Thomas Tuchel. The result was not pretty. What is going on with Thomas Mule, well, Thomas Mule's Bayern Munich and Thomas Tuchel's Bayern Munich? What is going on there? What really is going on? We'll talk about that as well as look ahead to the Champions League run of 16 matches happening on Tuesday and Wednesday. Don't sleep on that. All right, welcome back. You're watching Sports Zone on Joy Prime. My name is Fencho Tahir Fencho. We are on the last leg of the show. Uh, we are on from now till 10.30. Partly brought to you by Pride Bet, uh, Hunters, as well as Centex Tank. Lots of your messages have coming as well uh, on that WhatsApp number, which is 0240-910-330. 0240-910-330. This message says, uh, I'm sending... Uh, this is interesting. This message is from... Uh, it says he's watching us from Tumu. Chuck sent that message uh, from my people. Okay, Chuck. And he says, uh, good evening, City versus Chelsea next week. I'm watching you guys from Tumu, Upper West Region. Big shouts to everybody in Tumu for always locking down on this show. Uh, this message says, um, Emmanuel Agbeko in Sogakope. He says, uh, you guys are doing a good job. I think Man United is finding their rhythm. Leverkusen is some form this season. Bye to kick two kill, he says. Rodri and Vini all the way. Come, whatever. City is winning. Kudos to Cote d'Ivoire. How many things did he say in this one message? <laughs> Emmanuel Agbeku. He says, <laughs> I think United are finding their rhythm. That's first comment. Leverkusen is on form. Bye to two kill. Rodri and Vini all the way. Come whatever City is winning, kudos to Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> His summary teacher will be very good. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Emmanuel Agbeko, thanks for tuning in, as usual. I've got more messages here. This one says, uh, hey, so when Mango celebrate Afghan in Ghana? Mm. <laughs> Prosper in Tamale. Prosper, you and I are asking the same question. Uh, Dominic says... Um, uh, you used to call me chicken. I love your show, and your great analysis are always on point. Ah, it was one of my students at King's College. <laughs> call him chicken. Why would you call me out? I had a lot of nicknames <laughs> for this student. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he looked like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. What does chicken look like? He, he was very small. <laughs> I remember him now. Like, I remember it because that nickname was unique. I called him chicken. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a good teacher at all. Don't give your, don't give your students nicknames. All the teachers watching. <laughs> <laughs> all this happens. Um, anyway, shouts to you, Dominic. I'm very proud of you. Um, K Jr. from Teshi says the elephants all the way. Well, uh, they went all the way. Uh, this one says, um, hello, good evening, guys. I'm Sego Amor. Greetings to Bishop. It says, it says, very intelligent, intellectual discussion. This one says, uh, his name is Nana Yao, inside Chantra Hill in Accra. It says, listen, bro, I'm highly disappointed in our sports journalists, especially those in Kumasi. The GFA disrespected you this much throughout this AFCON, and yet organized a press briefing, invited you disrespectfully once again, and you honored their call. This was the best opportunity to make them see how influential and important uh, you guys are to the game. Shout to Bishop. Uh, tell him that Enzo Fernandez just scored again. Sports Zone, my all-time favorite show. Yes, Enzo Fernandez just scored. Chelsea have beaten Crystal Palace by three goals to one. Chelsea, who made to me? Can you? Why are you shouting? Oh, sorry. Hey, hey. <laughs> Why are you shouting? It's just Palace. Fain to be coming down. It's just Palace. Fain to be coming down. Shouting. It's just coming Palace. Down. Be coming down. City are on the horizon. This message says I should tell Atom Poku that uh, my team, United, is waiting for Liverpool patiently at Old Trafford. <laughs> Isaac Ousi in Tumu, he sent in that message. All right, guys, so uh, let's get the conversation going and take you to um, 
I think let's go to Spain first, shall we? Because it's been a lot happening there. Uh, Real Madrid took on Girona. And listen, Girona have had a wonderful season. And everybody thought Girona were in for a good run. Well, they were in for a good run until they met Real Madrid, who did not have defenders at all. In fact, all their defenders injured. And then they went to partner with Charmaine. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Kavaha mm -hmm. in center back. Yeah. And somehow run away, uh, winning the game by four goals to nil. Real Madrid. Okay, you know what? Let's take the highlights first. Wow, 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 Real Madrid. Carlo Ancelotti, he's just standing on the touchline like he's not coaching. <laughs> it's almost like he he doesn't even shout instructions. This guy just pockets. Look, he starts there and chews gum, and the team is winning. He's the most dynamic coach of the modern era. Say whatever you want to say about how others are proponents of the tactical principles that shape each era. Ancelotti just stays there, right? When you think he's finished. He can, and it doesn't matter the group you give him. He can make sense of that and give you a fantastic. It does team. matter though, because when they gave him everything, it wasn't that impressive. That was the outlier. Every other club where he's good. <laughs> kind of, kind of club. And and look, it, and, and it, it almost seems to me like the same conversation people have about Pep. No, he did. Let's give him everything and no, see what happens. He did them a favor. I mean, he's doing wonderful stuff with 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 Real Madrid. And and. You know why you I respect... do wonderful stuff with Everton. I respect what he's doing at Real Madrid because no other top coach will tolerate that. They won't. How many players have been injured? How many teams would lose their best player going into their next season? And the manager just says, well, we'll find solutions. So yes, they brought in Jude Bellingham. But that was a massive gamble to decide that we've lost Karim Benzema. We've lost some defenders. And at the start of the season, and up until now, they've had two ACLs. Yeah. You've had midfielders injured. And, you know, let's forget about the tactics and how he can evolve for a minute. Angelotti, in his post-match interview, said he was asked what, how he came about with that centre-back pairing for a game against Girona, who, by the way, for all intents and purposes, have been the best team in Spain this season. Yes. And he says he called Danny Cavall and asked him, between left centre back and right centre back, where would you like to play? Cavallar says, I don't care, play me wherever, I'll do the job for you. And then he calls um, Aurelio Chouameni and asks him, between left centre back and right centre back, where would you want to play? After the young man says where he would like to play, because he says he had played on the right before, he says, I'm going to play you at the left centre back. And he says, Cool, boss, just show me how to do the job and then we will deliver. In the last Champions League that Marcelo won with Real Madrid, we saw this playbook again, where in the final, Ancelotti is consulting with his players about how
how best to make the in-game adjustments. And it tells you one thing. He's not only someone who listens. He's able to bring his players to a point where they can make significant tactical inputs into how to execute. Because Great man management. Because it is one thing making players feel like they are part of it. It's another thing getting them to understand the tactical language right. to then be able to make inputs. And, and for me, that is even more difficult than any kind of ideas that you can have and say that it is futuristic or it is, it is profound or whatever. Look, what Ancelotti is doing is outrageous. And if he's able to add the Champions League for Real Madrid this season, we are looking at what possibly could be the greatest achievement in European football. If Ancelotti with this group is able to win the treble. That's true. Um, Collins, hang on for me because we're going to talk about their arch rivals, Barcelona, <laughs> who seem to have given up on pretty much anything this season. They've forgotten honestly. how to play football. <laughs> they, uh, they took on Granada and that ended in a 3 all draw. Uh, the only positive being Lamine Yamal. Obviously. Again, Obviously. wonderful brace he's caught. Take a look at this. This kid is the future, is he not? He's this defi kid, he definitely he's is. He's only probably the brightest spot in, in the team. All of us this season this year. Absolutely. There's no other positive in there. I just wish that uh, he wouldn't go down the path of Ansu Fati or Boyan Kerkic with well, injuries. one bad injury. But he's a breath of fresh air for them in such depressing moments. We need a character of that magnitude to uh, one of our own, a young star, La Masia. The glittering skills, he reminds you of somebody. You need all those things to hang on. Yeah. And look, it is the audacity of Granada for me. The team that had lost Brian Zaragoza to Bayern Munich brought in Facundo Pellistri. And look at the build up to all the goals. They literally just walked through Barcelona. And it's something that is quite worrying because Barcelona now play without intensity, the very intensity that you've come to associate with them the ability to press in a very structured format and then bring you some verticality in a game when they would have to go direct or probably rely on some very ultra-futuristic passing, making it look so pleasant to the eye, but mm -hmm. with end result. But you don't see all those things. You don't see those variations. So it is a hopeful punt up forward or a Lamin Yama moment of brilliance or magic. Other than that, Barcelona are certainly in trouble. And what really upset me this weekend was the fact that the Catalan press decided to hide Barcelona behind Girona for that epic game. 
which led officials of the club and then some players to say all sort of stuff, thinking about officiating and all those things. Look, yeah. you know what? If you really wanted to play them, you could have gone to do your job. Look at the them. plethora of attacking. Look at Savio. For all the noise about Savio, he comes into a game of this magnitude, yeah. he's not able to do anything. You, you line up a team, the usual performance, um, Jan Kuto like this, he couldn't play. You could actually see that this was a championship match and Real Madrid actually wanted to lay down the marker. So now when you begin to do that, you are creating a pseudo team that competes with Barcelona for the attention of the anti-establishment people. Yeah. And it, it doesn't work out that way. For all the anti-establishment rhetoric, let's understand that Barcelona have done very well and have actually controlled winning La Liga better than Real Madrid in recent times. Mm -hmm. So you don't do this. And for the people managing Girona, they should also understand that, look, we are that different. Forget about the Pep Guardiola and the other links that links and ties Girona to Barcelona. But you've got to do your job. Now, the biggest problem for them is that if they don't get enough revving, they would also become like Chelsea at some point, who would need to ship out some players by the 30th of June. Because they actually went on a spree that was unsustainable. Mortgage their fee. Absolutely. Liver FC activations and all those <laughs> things. I mean, you are still back to square one. And it, you can't co compete for some of the very best in the system now. You'd rather have to hope, like you hear Deco speak these days, the hopefulness in his speeches yeah. that we've done good to this agent in recent in time past. So this person in our times of distress should also come to yeah. our aid. It doesn't work out that way. And they ought to change the mentality and psyche around the club. They've literally thrown in the towel. It, basically, because right now they are 10 points behind uh, behind Real Madrid. Uh, Girona are some five points behind Real Madrid, so it's not so bad for them, but it's really bad for Barcelona. The air of uncertainty, coach is leaving at the end of the season, oh, God, what are yeah. we going to it's do and awful. all that. It's awful. Uh, I want to take you to Germany because something amazing is happening there. Yeah. Bayer Leverkusen are still on beating in all competitions this season. Their coach is Javi Alonso. He's only in his second season of senior management. They are unbeaten in all competitions this season. They're top of the Bundesliga. They came up against Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich had a habit of always beating teams that were chasing them for the title. So a lot was riding on this match. Well, in the end, how oh dear old my dear. Listen, Collins, take me to it. First of all, <laughs> uh, Listen, the goal comes. All right, okay, but now why are you taking the, the highlights from me again? I'm talking to them, you are taking it away from me. What is the meaning of that? Thank you. Let's go back to it. There you go. The first goal is gone. Then this is the second goal. Um, ah, not the second goal. I think this is it. Another brilliant save. Lots of, there were so many moments in this match where Leverkusen looked like they were going to go. They were there dominant. Look at that finish. Look at that finish. Absolutely Absolute. brilliant. That was Grimaldo's goal, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. That was it. Oh, fantastic. And this. And then Jeremy Frimpong comes off the bench and he scores an absolute blinder. Look at that. <laughs> the center back, was that Leroy Sat? Look at it. Oh God, that's the first goal. He doesn't celebrate because he's a buying player. Yeah, yeah. and the loss allowed him standing stage. And Tuchel says after the match that he liked this. He said there's this little nice rule in England where if you're clutching us, literally you clutching us, cross. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, guys, I, you tell me what's going on with Tuchel. And you tell me what's going on with that also because I love what is happening. Let me, be, yes. let me admit Yes, go that. on. But the fact that actually it's Bayern Liverpool, <laughs> Bayern Liverpool scares me. Look, they are capable of the unexpected. But then you take yourself back to the summer of 2000. Oh, God. They were literally on their way to winning the treble for the first time. Yes. With Klaus Topmola, Kasper Ramilo, Oliver Neuville, Z. Roberto, Balag, Lucio. Who was in there? The reality. This is a proper bottless club. You know, I went, you know, I was there recently. Yeah. The, the, the nickname is Neverkus. Yeah. Absolutely. 
when the Neverkusen comes in, <laughs> there could be trouble. So it's beautiful. They have a history, at this stage, a very unwanted history. So beautiful. But look, let's understand that this thing could go down south and go down south at any point in time. But the point is, someone has to be there to take advantage. Yes. Do you think buying are in that place right now? This football club has a way around this league. When Dortmund slipped, they were there to take advantage on the last day. True. So last I, year. I would want us to wait till the end. The quality of football here is in the inverted nature of the two midfielders sitting there. Yes. And one being taxed with the primary job of controlling tempo and identifying pressing triggers for the people ahead of him to impress. So in the build-up phase, they build up in a 2-1. And yes. the one that comes to join is one of the centre-backs. Now, in this very game, Kapsoba, Jonathan Ta, and then they bring in someone in. Ordinarily, that should be Odion Kosunu. Yeah, who is in good So you take him out. Up front, he brought a false nine vets. Ordinarily, Patrick Schick also plays around him. Yes. Uh, if Victor Boniface is here and Schick is here, he will play Boniface. Boniface is out injured. Huge blow for him. No problem. Why? Because there is fluidity and movement, which allows Grimaldo and Jeremy Frimpong to take the positions they take on the pitch. And it's synchronized in such a manner that they can start with the 4 2 3 1, like we all saw, yeah. and then fix it into a 3 4 3, and then constantly allow Jaka to play these kind of balls and also identify the triggers and open up between centre backs and full backs of the opposing team. That's where they were feasting. I have a wild question for you. Do you think Javi Alonso should be Liverpool manager? After it's, a, it's a fairy tale look. I'm scared. A little too early. It's coming yeah, a little too early. For it's too good to be true. I'm, look, look, I'm scared. The whole romanticism around it. Yeah. Liverpool. It doesn't usually work, does it? It doesn't. And look, I've seen I, I've been around long enough to see that when you go off a successful manager who has been around for long, it's difficult to be successful right after that person. It's always been the case. Do you think Tuko will survive the season? I don't think so. You don't think he will survive the yeah, season? Yeah, I agree with him too. All right, it's Champions League coming. Maybe that would change uh, the minds of the Bayern hierarchy. But on Tuesday, there is Copenhagen against Man City. Very straightforward for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the fixtures. Uh, what about Leipzig against Real Madrid? So much it will blow them away. Yeah, Leipzig are not in a great place. Collins, you take the Wednesday's game. Uh, I would have said Sociedad would give Paris and Jamar some tough time, but Sociedad themselves are not in a good form right now. Yeah, but uh, the major attraction of this game is in Southeast Asia. But Take Kubo yeah. and Lee Kanyi are coming up in the Champions League in a manner that they are going to sell the two sides so well. Look, again, this is no more the fantasy show PSG. Yeah. It is not a game. It's a business club. And you watch them now and you see players that headed to Bradley Barcola taking the game to people, Randa Kolumwani taking... Look, they'll right. get around society that easily. Okay. They, so, would, they would do that. Anyway, and uh, there's redemption time for Bayern Munich against Lazio, so hopefully that happens. Uh, we'll see what happens there. But thank you very much. That's our show for this evening. My name is Frencho. I hear Frencho. Thank you to Collins. Thank you to Achu for being here with us. Uh, we're back again next Monday. Until then, take care and bye-bye.